Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to The Vine, the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors and minister of visitation. And it's my joy to welcome you to our service this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. And we would also appreciate if you would register your attendance. Uh, in just a moment, a QR code will pop up uh, on the screen. You can hold your uh, phone in camera mode over that, your smartphone, and it'll give you a link, or there will be a link also in the video description. We'd love to know that you're worshiping with us uh, in the vine, and also you can let us know of any prayer concerns that you may have. Once again, welcome to our worship service today. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I ain't gonna study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more I ain't gonna study war no more Gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna walk with the Prince of Peace down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. I'm gonna walk with the Prince of Peace down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. I ain't gonna study war no more, 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 I ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna shake hands around the world, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, I'm gonna shake hands. Around the world, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I ain't gonna study war no more. 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 Let us pray. Lord of light and life, you have called us this day to open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to hear your words of encouragement, your words of healing, your words of hope. Give us patience and willingness to serve you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Virginia Gray Norville and I will be telling you about my amazing mission trip I went on. I made so many great friends and I absolutely loved my counselors I met. I loved how I was serving God and the community. Going to the refuge changed my relationship with God in so many different ways. Now I love him more every single day. My favorite part of the trip would probably be at a barn when I got smashed down lots of old things. It was very fun. And we I also loved when we went down to downtown Farmville and we picked up lots of trash. It's crazy how much trash can end up downtown. That that same day, my group and I were walking down the street of downtown and we saw these six about six people working out in the 80 in the 98 degree weather. So Miss Caroline said, let's get them a cold drink, like a cold Gatorade. So we did, and I could just see God in that moment. I had a set, I had the best time at the mission trip and I will, it will always have a special place in my heart. Thank you for listening today and thank you for all your, all your support. Hi, my name is Catherine Chosick and today I'll be talking about the wonderful mission trip I went on. Last month, I went on my first ever mission trip, and I had the best time ever. My, I made so many good memories, but my favorite part was probably serving God in the community. The first day, my group got to build a wheelchair ramp. Then the third day, we picked up trash off the highway, and so much more. The, every night, we would go to worship and sing songs and talk about God. That really can, I felt really connected with God, and I still do. That experience changed my life forever because when I saw the people and met the people, they were so happy and grateful for all they had. And it made me realize that I, that I need to be more grateful for all I have. Thank you for all your support for the youth to go on this trip. In the highways, in the hedges, in the Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes, one of the associate pastors here, and it's my privilege to get to lead us in prayer this morning. As I'm leading us through prayer, I will stop and say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to join in by saying, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Triune God, we come to you this morning excited to worship you. When we look around the world, we see evidence of your glory and your goodness. We also come to you this morning in great need. We need to encounter you and to be transformed by your unending love. So be with us now and hear these prayers. We pray for Christians all over the world. Holy Spirit, fall on us and transform us like you did on Pentecost. Work in us and enable us to will and to work for your good pleasure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and for all the nations of the world. Guide us in the ways of justice and peace 
and help us to honor and serve each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us respect and appreciation for the earth as your own creation. Teach us to use its resources rightly, not for our own selfish gain, but in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for your blessing for our friends, our family, and our communities. Help us to serve Christ by serving them and help us to love them as Christ has loved us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in the midst of their suffering and bring them the joy that comes only from you. We pray especially for those affected by the flooding in Kentucky. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we thank you and praise you for your great love. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to the time in our service where we have the opportunity to worship God by giving back to God a portion of what God has given to us. We know that everything that we have comes from God, and so our giving is a response to the generosity that God has already shown us. There are several ways that you can give at this time. You can always write a check and send it in the mail. You can also give on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or by using our cell phone app. As we prepare now for this time of giving, please join me in prayer. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love you formed us in your image. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith and the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel within a wheel way in the middle of the air. But a man might be running how you walk on the cross way in the middle of the air. Your foot might slip and your soul get lost way in the middle of the air. Wrightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today I want to talk to you about breaking things. 
I have some items with me and I'm wondering how easy they would be to break and if you can help me think of ways to break them. The first one's probably pretty easy. This is just a piece of notebook paper. How do you think we can break this? I was thinking, let's just rip it. Woohoo! Yeah, that's really easy. Okay, so a piece of paper breaks very, very easily. Let's see, what else do I have in here? Next I have this little twig I found outside. This might be a little bit harder than paper. What do you think? Think we can break this one? Yep, that was pretty easy. Okay, let's try something harder. How about a soda can? I had this for lunch this morning. Well, let's see, this one's maybe a little bit trickier. We can't rip it. What do you think? Maybe we can kind of smash it. See that? Ooh, that makes a fun sound. Okay, so we could break that one. That's good. Let's try one more. Okay, this is a metal pan that maybe you'd bake cookies or brownies in or a cake. You know, I don't think I'm strong enough to break this one. Maybe if you were here with me, we could try and hit it really hard. Ah, so we can't break it here, but how do you think we might break it? Maybe we could all hit it with hammers. Maybe we could try and run it over with a car. I don't know, but I bet there's probably something we could do to break this. Do you think there's anything in the world that couldn't break? I'm trying to think of something that if you had the right tools, you couldn't break. Just about everything's breakable. You know, there's one thing though that I can think of that can never, ever, 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 ever times infinity break no matter how hard you try. Do you know what that is? It's the love of God. God loves you so much that Romans chapter eight tells us that there's nothing in this whole world, there's no tool, there's nothing that can break that love. And even there's nothing in the whole universe, in heaven or anywhere, no magic that can break God's love. God's love is the only thing in the whole universe that can never, ever, ever break. God loves you, and there is nothing you can do about it. I'm really glad that God's love can't be broken, because that means that no matter what we do, no matter if we mess up, or if we live really, really special lives, or just normal lives, God's love for us won't change. There's nothing in the whole world or the whole universe that can stop God's love. Let's pray. God, thank you that your love is the only unbreakable thing in the universe. Thank you that we know that you will love us no matter what happens. We love you back. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, it's good to be with you again. My name's Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I missed you last week as I was away with my wife celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. Went back to the same area where we honeymooned and had a great, great time. So thank you for um, uh, allowing me that absence. And it was great to hear uh, Pastor Julia's sermon from last Sunday. And, but it's also wonderful to be back and be among you today. We're continuing to uh, go through the Bible, looking at stories of salvation and how that impacts our lives. And today we're going to Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28 through the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul writes to us, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. 
And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It's Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us a chance to take a breath, to breathe you in and breathe you out, and to worship you this day. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together would be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Karl Barth was a prolific Swiss theologian back in the 20th century. He wrote pages and pages of books, which in turn influenced thousands and thousands of other writers, preachers, professors, and even politicians. The Pope once said that Karl Barth was the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas, which is really saying something since Aquinas lived more than 700 years ago. But Barth was rarely short on words. His five-volume opus entitled Church Dogmatics was more than 9,000 pages long. So if anyone's looking for that last end-of-summer read, you can go see if the new Hanover Library has a copy of that. Anyway, in 1962, Bart was featured on the cover of Time magazine while touring the United States. And one of his lectures took place at the beautiful Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago. After his lecture during the question and answer time, a student asked Bart if he could summarize his entire life's work in theology in just one single sentence. Bart replied to the questioner, yes, I can. In the words of a song that I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. The greatest theologian of the past eight centuries, according to Pope Pius XII, a person who once wrote a book about God that had more than six million words in it, summed up his life's work as a theologian with the words of a simple song that most of you know pretty well. Would you sing it with me? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you know the second verse? Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. One more. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. I can't help but feel that that little song sums up everything I want to talk about today. We are weak, but Jesus is strong. 
And yes, Jesus loves me. In fact, he loves all of us. Another way you could sum up this passage that I've just read is not just through that song, but maybe through something just as simple, like life is tough, but God is good, and God is faithful. Let's look at this passage a little bit more in depth, because I think it's really important. The first thing this passage in Roman tells us is that we are known and that our future has already been planned. Now, unfortunately, Paul uses a word here that I think confuses us more by the baggage it carries than by its real meaning. And that word, of course, is predestined. It's not a word you hear much in United Methodist circles. And to be honest with you, it even feels strange to my ears just reading it in a passage of Scripture. But God doesn't have to please me. I've got to please God. And that word is here, and we've got to deal with it. And in doing a word study and prepping for this sermon, I found it interesting that the use of this word is really more in keeping with John Wesley's idea of prevenient grace than with the idea of our normal association with predestination. Wesley's idea and the idea that Paul is trying to convey is that the Christian life, the grace of God, and our salvation through faith is all a gift. A gift chosen by God for us before we even became aware of it. That makes sense, right? That God is working on your life way before you even recognize He's doing so. In fact, God knew what we were going to need even before we were born. And God made, started making plans for our arrival. Kind of like a couple plans to have children. There are various stages that they go through. First, there's the planning and the preparation, then the creation. And as the baby begins to grow inside the mother's tummy, you read what to expect when you're expecting. I guess people still read that. And then the parents begin the process of choosing a name. You know, most of the time, long before the baby's born, the child's already named. You get the house prepared. You set up a nursery with a crib. Clothes and diapers and diaper genies and all the things that little tiny babies need are purchased. You go to countless doctor's appointments to check on the health of the child. And everything's made ready for the birth. And then it comes. The pain and rejoicing all meld into one. Months of anticipation and then you get to hold that precious, cute little God-given bundle. And life will never be the same. Can you tell I've got two kids going off to college in the next month? But we all know the process of developing a person isn't finished when you bring the child home from the hospital. You don't just bring a baby home and place it on a shelf like a knick-knack or a you know, prized piece of art. <coughs> no, parents begin thinking about the future. Well, what's the child going to eat? When should you potty train? When will they begin sleeping through the night? What daycare, what preschool, what pediatrician should you use? Later in life, it's things like, well, will they have friends? What do I do if I don't like their friends? When do I get them a cell phone? What's an appropriate age for them to start dating? When should they get their own car? What college will they go to? Now, as parents, we have our ideas. We might even have some things mapped out and planned out. Maybe we're fiercely loyal to our college and we have said, my kids are all going to UNC or UNCW or UNC or ECU or UNC or maybe NC State or even, I don't know, UNC. That's the way it is with God. God has created us. God foreknew us. And just as we foreknow the babies that are born to us, God has our lives planned out for us. God and God's great wisdom and grace has gone before us and prepared a path. It's not always the easy way, nor is it always the clear way. But the good news is that God has already been there before us and he knows the consequences of our every action. That's why God is God. But God has given us the free will to make choices for ourselves. God's heart might break over our decisions, just like a die-in-the-wool Tar Heel fan might break if their son or daughter chooses Duke or State. But because we love them, we let them make that choice. And because God loves us, God lets us make the choices in our lives. 
That's what I think Paul means by this idea of being foreknown and predestined. God is our heavenly parent who's made every provision for our well-being. God knows every aspect of our life, and despite any and all mistakes we might make, God still wants us to live with Him throughout eternity. He's planned on it from the very beginning. Nevertheless, we choose. He gives us that opportunity. He gives us that gift to choose whether or not to accept His grace and the gift of eternal life with Him. We get to choose. We are known. Our future's been planned. God's already chosen us, but he gives us the opportunity to choose God back or not. And that's where this idea of being called and claimed comes in. Paul tells us that we've been called and claimed by God through Christ. We are called and claimed, but the only way to get from one to the other is through Jesus. It's like two people standing on opposite sides of a river. One is sick, the other has the cure. But the cure can't be given or received until some way is found to get across that river. The two people might even be close enough that they can converse across the river, but still not actually make the exchange. They need a bridge, something that will bring them together. That's the way it is for us. Remember at the very beginning of this series when we talked about how sin came into the world? The story of Adam and Eve tells us that we are separated from God by our choice of saying no to God. And the more we've tried to fix the problem, the, really the worse it's gotten. All the boats and rafts that we build just won't float. The river or the gorge is that gulf between us and God. And sin is the terminal illness that infects our soul. There's only one solution, a bridge. One built by God's own hand. And so God sent Jesus to be that bridge. And Jesus built that bridge made out of one cross with two boards and three nails so that we would be forgiven. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection, we move from simply being called to being called and claimed. And we're claimed because we're cured by the love of Christ. Years ago, a sociology professor at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore assigned his class to an impoverished part of the city to go interview 200 boys. He said, on the basis of your findings, predict their future. Shocked at what they saw in this disadvantaged part of the city, the students estimated that 90% of the boys interviewed would someday end up serving time in prison. 20 years later, the same professor asked another class to locate these same 200 boys and compare what happened. Of the 180 boys that they could find, only four had actually ever been to jail. Why had the predictions by the earlier class proven to be so wrong? Well, they found a common denominator in that almost all of these men remembered having the same high school teacher, Miss O'Rourke, who'd been a tremendous influence on them. After a long, long search, Sheila O'Rourke was found in a nursing home in Memphis, Tennessee. When asked for her explanation, she was puzzled and replied, Well, all I did was love every last one of them. And that's all Jesus did for us. He loved every last one of us. And he loves us with an unconditional love that spans the gap between us and God that was caused by our sin. There's nothing we can do on our own to get across that gap. But there is plenty that's been done for us. As we say in our communion liturgy, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. Christ himself became the bridge so that we can make the trek across that gap and receive that all-important cure to sin and death. All we got to do is accept the gift of love offered to us by Jesus. We're already called, and we're already claimed. And once we've accepted God's call and are living as His claimed, we're then held and strengthened. Eliza Morgan tells a story in a parenting magazine how one night her 11-year-old daughter Eva noticed she was distracted as she tucked her into bed. 
Mom told her about a friend's teenage daughter whose hair was mysteriously falling out. Mom encouraged her daughter Eva to pray for Amy, which she did with these simple words. She said, Jesus, please hold Amy's hair on her head. As the doctors experimented with different treatments, Amy continued to lose her hair. And so Eva continued to pray the same prayer, Jesus, please hold Amy's hair on her head. After six weeks, the doctors determined that Amy had alopecia, a rare disorder that causes people's hair to fall out, usually in very unpredictable patterns, until the person is completely bald. When mom told her, e her daughter Eva about the diagnosis, Eva took mom's hand and closed her eyes. This time her prayer was slightly different. Dear Jesus, if you won't hold Amy's hair on her head, would you please hold Amy? That's exactly what God does. Paul says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Whatever we're going through, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The good news is that once we are called and once we are claimed, we are held no matter what the situation. And we are strengthened to face any situation. One of my favorite movies of all times is Four Weddings and a Funeral. came out. Gosh, what now? Almost 30 years ago. And at the funeral scene, the, the poem Funeral Blues by W.H. Alden is read out loud, some of whose lines include, He was my north, my south, my east, my west, my working week, and my Sunday rest. My noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought love would last forever. I was wrong. It's a sad and profound moment in the movie. And as much as I love the movie, I've got to say, the poem is wrong. Dead wrong. Love does last forever. That's the meaning of resurrection. That's the meaning behind this passage. Love binds us to Christ, our bridge, that holds the cure for sin and death. And through Christ's love, we are strengthened so that nothing in life, nor in death, Nothing, no exceptions, will overcome us or separate us from Him. Even in the face of death, there is resurrection. In the face of illness, there is eternal healing. In the face of danger, there's the right arm of God. In the face of adversity, there is blessed assurance. In the face of confrontation, there is confidence. In the face of sin, there's forgiveness from the cross. In the face of temptation, there is the gift of Christ's faithfulness. In the face of greed, there's abundant life. In the face of pollution, there's God's redemption of all creation. In the face of hunger and homelessness, there's compassion and care. In the face of hardship, there's the promise of goodness. In the face of whatever comes our way, God holds us and provides the strength we need to be faithful just as Christ is faithful. We are held and we are strengthened. Paul says we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And we're called to be conformed to the image of His Son. But my favorite part of the scriptures is part of the end where Paul says we are more than conquerors. It reminds me a little bit about college basketball season. I, for one, cannot stand missing a live sporting event where I have a rooting interest in the game. To me, I've got to watch it live. I want to see the drama play out. It's not the same watching the same game recorded after it's already been played. But I got a friend who's just the opposite. He just gets too nervous watching his favorite team play live on television. So he DVRs all the games. And he waits to see if his team wins before he watches it. it. Totally changes the way he watches basketball. If his team misses a shot or the other team steals the ball, it's no problem. He thinks that's bad, but it's okay. We're going to win in the end. That's what Romans 8 reminds me of for Christians. We know how it ends. We've already read the last chapter of the book. We know the outcome. Jesus is going to win. That's the plan. He even told us in John 16, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So when going through trouble, 
Knowing the final outcome makes all the difference. That's why Paul wrote, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Know how I know? The Bible tells me so. Remember, whatever situation you find yourself or whatever trouble comes your way, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our, our Lord. For we may be weak, but He is strong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Holy and gracious God, Lord, we are so grateful to know that you are there for us. Even in the midst of our weakness, even in the midst of our sin, you have brought us the cure in your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might overcome anything that is troubling us. Lord, lift our spirits even today. Help us to realize that we're on the winning side, and that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Father, thank you for that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Please know that whatever you're going through in your life, whatever may come, Jesus loves you. And nothing, nothing in life nor in death can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing.